Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Live with Coach RT3. We're just waiting on our guest today, uh, Michael Ramos. Uh, he's out in NYC. He's the founder of um, The Moving Project. Um, I had a chance to meet uh, Mike uh, last year, which was really cool. Um, hey Mike, how's it going? What's up? How's everything? Cool. So I was just giving everybody a little background on you uh, just now as they were tuning in, or if they were tuning in, um, just letting them know that you were the creator of Movement Moving Project, let me yes. get that correct, and um, just telling them we, we met last year um, at the RevFit, for the first time actually, at the RevFit um, certification, Revolutionary Fitness. Um, connected there for a few days, which was really cool. And then came back for uh, my mace workshop and got a chance to hook up again. Yeah. Um, your mace skills are have been improving and have been impressive. So that's been cool to watch um, over time. But um, just wanted to give you an opportunity to um, share uh, with with our audience. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of in inquiries about your awesome shirt. Um, and so uh, I thought it was, there's boy. another awesome shirt, <laughs> shameless self promotion. Yep, Go ahead and do that. Cause that's what this show is all about. This show is about, uh, promoting and uplifting others, um, as well as just kind of having an opportunity to have open discussion, dialogue and commune. So, um, without further ado, let's jump right on in. Let's um, do it. so, um, just tell us a little bit more about the uh, Moving Project. Um, just give us an idea of, of what that's about. Um, so Moving Project is basically uh, my attempt to establish a physical culture, um, you know, within, I live in New York City, so within New York City, and hopefully it'll expand uh, elsewhere. So basically I run um, meetups, um, I run different movement meetups, and the goal is to uh, share skills. So um, everyone comes from a different movement background. So I have uh, dancers, I have like yoga, like yogis, um, martial artists, and we come together and uh, we explore movement together. So more than that, I want to just create different outlets for people. Um, to always have a way to move and always have uh, something that they can plug into. Um, so uh, I'll give you a, a couple examples of some of the recent ones we did. So um, we did a meetup exploring a concept of play and uh, contact. Because mm -hmm. I feel like you know within um, within society and in the in, in the way the culture is going, people are so uh, disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, so we were playing with the dynamic of, of touch and uh, how that relates to one another. So we were exploring concepts within contact improv, um, a couple of wrestling drills, uh, roughhousing, um, you know, different things of that nature. So mm -hmm. when, I, when I organize a meetup, um, I give like a, a loose framework of, you know, what we want to accomplish. But then I let mm -hmm. things be very organic because, you know, everyone has different skills and everyone comes in at a different level. So right. um, I don't want to be, you know, like the guru trying to tell you like, oh, yeah, I'm all high and mighty. I'm going to teach you. I want everything to be where everyone is on their own path, but uh, we can learn from one another. So it's kind of like the right. idea of... Uh, you know, teacher without a teacher type of thing. Cool. I think you were <clears throat> in our, in our kind of discussion, uh, when, when I was back there in New York, I, I felt like, um, you were kind of, you kind of called it like your, your graduate school project. Like you yeah. were creating, creating kind of like a self study for yourself, um, which included other, other people and exploration of, of different, you know, movement sort of, philosophies out there so um is that still what the project is is currently about yeah definitely um well that's actually how it started uh to begin with um so it, it didn't 
the community is kind of a result of it, but the original um, roots of how I came to this this uh, conclusion was I read a book called The Art of Nonconformity by Chris Joe Bao. Um, mm -hmm. I can I can shout out other people's stuff, right? I guess. Shout out whatever you need. Man. All right, cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I read I read Art of Nonconformity, and I was very inspired by it. And uh, at one point during the book, um, you know, he had went to graduate school, and he said he wasn't necessarily fulfilled with uh, the way that it was taught, and he felt as though he didn't get enough practical knowledge to take into the real world. So he created his own uh, self-directed uh, graduate school program, and basically what I did was I took the idea of that concept and just tailored it to myself. So um, lately I've been on this, this uh, uh, trying to get more uh, self-reliant. So this was kind of a response to that. This was me trying to be more self-reliant. So um, I created four categories. Uh, the first one being mental hypertrophy, which is read more books. Uh, second thing is skill acquisition. So I realized that I rely so much on, on uh, other people to do things. So I wanted to acquire those skills for myself. So mm -hmm. I'm a lousy cook. I want to learn how to get better at cooking. Um, uh, my ethnicity is, you know, I'm Puerto Rican and black, but I don't speak any Spanish. So speaking Spanish is one thing that I wanted to learn. Um, mm -hmm. How to build things, how to grow plants basically how to, how to survive in different sort of ways. Uh, so that was one category. Uh, the, the next category was uh, physical contests. So I just wanted to challenge myself. Um, so do like, Tough mutters and come up with any sort of random uh, physical challenges for myself and uh, compete in them. And mm -hmm. then the last one, and this is where everything really started to evolve, was uh, you know, build a tribe. So I think uh, there's, that, there's that famous African proverb, um, if you want to go fast, go by yourself, and if you want to go far, go together, or something, mm -hmm. I'm not doing that, but something like that. <laughs> I've uh, never heard it, but sounds sounds legit. Yeah, it sounds legit, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so there's that proverb. So it's basically like, uh, you know, it's cool if you do all this stuff by yourself, but um if you really want to start a movement, then you need other people to challenge you, you know? Right. Right. So cool. That's, that's, that's pretty dope. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we had like, we had the chance to kind of explore together, which was really cool. Um, because for me, you know, I was kind of just moving into movement, but I kind of approach it from like, um, having a strong framework and foundation, whereas, you know, you know, when I observe you and I observe you move, um, I kind of see it as more of like free form. And so for me, it was kind of like, like mind opening just to like, kind of have that interaction with you because, you know, I really feel like, you know, you can approach movement from different, different ways, you know, and, you know, there's a time to be free and then there's a time to maybe work on something specific that you're trying to accomplish. Um, so it's like skill acquisition, right? I want to be sure. able to do this particular thing. Um, but I think like inspiring wise, like watching you move and have contact with the, the ground and the floor and things like that was just more kind of like eye opening. I still have my reservations about <laughs> about the floor and the ground, um, but it's something that both yourself and um, uh, Andrew uh, with with the parkan, yeah, um, just kind of like opened a little window for me and was like, okay, here's some things you can do, but they're kind of like outside of my comfort zone, yeah. Um, so I kind of see you doing that uh, with your with your YouTube videos, and that's kind of evolved as well, which is really cool. Oh yeah, um, I don't even so... know what direction I'm going anymore, but uh, <laughs> it's it's awesome. <laughs> it's a journey. Yeah, I mean, um, the most recent video I think I saw uh, you posted was um, about like 
meditating in public or something like that i think it was oh yeah yeah that was really uh interesting could you um tell people kind of like more about that oh yeah um so i started doing uh are you familiar with fighting monkey uh fighting monkey yeah. fitness group yeah yeah so i haven't taken a, a full workshop with them but um i've trained a couple of times with uh uh, a good friend, Eswad, um, mm -hmm. who does uh, classes in the Lower East Side. Um, he has, like, a, like daily practices. So I go mm -hmm. to him sometimes. And um, one of the things that he always starts out with is stillness, right? Mm. So, you know, when we think of, obviously, when you think of movement, you think of moving. But, like, to, to be still and to be comfortable with yourself and to be aware of yourself is literally the first step before you can do anything else. Um, right. And especially with, with, uh, you know, ground movements or, um, any of this other quote unquote, like unconventional type of, uh, movement. It's weird. Like mm. from the outside looking in, it's very weird. <laughs> so yeah. in addition to the physical challenge of doing, the actual movement there's like a, a social um construct that's that's attached to it as well so if you're doing this in public people are going to stare at you and you're going to have judgment you know right and uh you can use that as a as a metaphor for you know what it is but like in life people are going to look at you and people are going to judge you right so if you can be still and you can be uh comfortable with yourself and kind of be the observer to what's going on that's that's really powerful um, right so what we were doing in that public space was we went to the most crowded place in new york city and that just happens to be a uh, a train station um the oculus so it's right underneath the world trade center there's like mm -hmm. eight different trains that go there the path train there's stores it's every there's a hustle and bustle of people. So everyone's right. going somewhere, everyone's doing something, and we wanted to stand still in the middle for uh, our challenge was to do at least one minute. Uh, mm -hmm. Eyes closed, don't move. Um, but we ended up doing longer than that. And uh, it was it was, it was was interesting. It must have been pretty intense, right? You probably heard a lot of stuff going on. I mean, if your eyes are closed, right, you don't see what's going on, so you probably hear a lot more so exactly. using that sense exactly. and probably like using your sense of smell smell and hearing a lot more than you than you normally would right um yeah the, i think the craziest thing was you're standing there and your eyes are closed so you really get to focus on what's going on in your head mm -hmm. so all the noises that you hear it almost feels like it's happening inside of you right <laughs> So it's nuts. It's really nuts. You also, I would assume you have to have a fair bit of, I mean, you're, you're there with somebody else. So you're probably, you know, you have that, that trust level. But I mean, I imagine if you were doing that on your own or by yourself, that'd be kind of like, you know, you'd have to trust that nobody's going to come up and do something, you know, weird to you exactly. or um, stuff like that. But it's, it's, um, it's really just mental training. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you have, a, you have a military background and, um, I think that's interesting because, you know, I just wanted to find out like how, I mean, movement is not a big like practice, let's say with inside of like, you know, the military communities, oh, I would, <laughs> I mean, I kind of. I kind of envision, I see more of like a, a, a kind of a CrossFit, more of a like aggressive, masculine, even though we're, we're, we're on the same team and we're communing together, don't touch me, <laughs> um, yeah. sort of, sort of thing. Um, how do you, how, how have you been able to like, move into this sort of space you know after kind of coming through the constructs of of like military structure 
Um, well, I mean, the first thing is that, uh, is, is not being afraid to be different because the criticism is going to come and it's the worst criticism ever because, uh, in the Marine Corps, they yell at you for everything. So it's not even like, hey, you're weird. It's like, you're fucking weird. Like, you know, it's aggressive. Um, but the, the one thing that really, uh, that really solidified things for me was uh, when I was deployed. I was deployed overseas. I was in Bahrain. And then from Bahrain, we went to Jordan. And, you know... A lot of the guys that I was with, they would go to the gym and they would just do bodybuilding things. So chest day, three days a week, you know, mm-hmm. legs, never, you know, <laughs> right. like just regular bodybuilding stuff, right? <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's cool if you're training for uh, a physique show, right? Right. But we had to do very physical things. Um, so when you do the, the Marine Corps martial arts, it's called McMap. When you do McMap, half of it is conditioning and the other half is, you know, fighting and techniques and stuff. So when you do the conditioning part, we would run out into the desert and carry gear. And then in the middle of our run, they would be like, okay, uh, we just took fire. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. Okay. Everyone has to carry you and all the gear somewhere else. So now, <laughs> yeah. So now I'm at, at that point, I was like 155. Um, and I was doing like powerlifting, but I was doing a lot of movement stuff too. So like I'm 155 and I'm going to have to carry this guy that's 195, you know, right. all upper body, no legs. And he's carrying like 40 pounds worth of gear, 50 pounds worth of gear. And I have to carry you. So now you're a burden, you know, right. and on the flip side, if you can't run, you can't even lift your arm overhead like this. You can't touch your toes. Like, so you look like you're really strong, but you're not functional whatsoever. So right. I would use that as like motivation. Like if, if someone was telling me like, oh, you should do like bodybuilding with us or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, well, you should be touching your toes. Like how about let's start there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. You should be doing more applicable stuff half yeah. the time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I'm assuming, like, crawling is important, you know, being yeah. able to, like, you know, jump, land, roll, like, all of these pretty, like, fundamental movement patterns, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, most traditional workouts kind of feed into, like you said, physique or, or strength. Um, Joe, who's, who's watching here... Um, he says uh, most workouts uh, were boring and non-functional. He totally agrees. Joe yeah. is a friend of mine here. Uh, he was he's former military as well, so oh, you nice. know he has uh, he has some background in in training um, with military. He's actually transitioning into training uh, fitness training uh, now as a as a career, which is pretty cool um, awesome. to see. So. Um, we've had some great conversations to ourselves, so I'm glad he's tuning in. Oh, so he but, knows. Um, he, knows. <laughs> he knows exactly what you've, you've experienced. Um, I mean, I would say the same about most things out there. Like, you know, when I was in school and we had football practice, I mean, the the training and the, the workouts we had for football were totally <laughs> useless. I mean, at that time, you know, like in the yeah. God, in the 90s, right? In the 90s, it was like, let's, you know, do some bodybuilding. I think at the collegiate level, they were already doing like more of the, you know, Olympic lifting and things like that, more power lifting. Um, but I know for the most part, it was still like, let's just bench press. And I mean, they still actually they still do the tests, right, for the NFL. You still got to bench press X amount. <clears throat> and I mean... Makes sense if you're going to be, or if, no, it's, I, well, I haven't watched the combine for a while, but I think it's still in there. Um, Mm -hmm. If if you watch the bench press, yeah, 225 for multiple reps, it's still pretty sloppy. Um, You know, guys are just trying to get it up any way they can. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, don't get me wrong, like, 
like having explosive power to push, you know, is, is great. The problem is these guys are on their back doing it, you know, like I, I don't know, yeah. you know, what the right answer is for measuring, but I think you, you're doing different jobs. You're an offensive lineman. You're a running back. You're doing two different things. Um, I mean, someone was like, bicep curls are not functional. And I'm like, well, if you're carrying a football, I think you need to be able to isometrically contract your biceps while somebody's yeah. trying to rip it out of your hand. So maybe a bicep curl is functional for that task. You know, so I mean, <clears throat> there's tons of arguments about about all these different things out there. I think yeah, um, that's a that's a huge thing, and uh, I hear that all the time. Is is people throw around this word functional, but like functional is relative to whatever you're doing. You know, yeah, like like the bicep curl, like oh, when am I going to isolate my biceps? Um, if you've ever tried shoveling, like here on the East Coast, you shovel snow. That's a bicep curl right there. Yeah, like it is. <laughs> you know it is i mean it's not in isolation it's with the use of you know rotation and all these other things but um it's still a, a bicep curl uh, yeah. to a certain degree um so yeah i mean you're totally I, I think you're totally right i mean that that debate will probably rage on forever um <laughs> and ever and ever yeah um but um so in New York, um, I mean, there's so much going on as far as like fitness goes. Like it's like the hotbed. Yeah, it's one of the hotbeds I think for for um, fitness and things like that. And Joe says, "Carry your kids, right?" That's a yeah. isometric bicep curl, right? Yeah. Um, so the 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 culture in New York, is it really receptive to movement? I know Mike Fitch started like uh, Animal Flow and, and Equinox there in, in New York, I believe, right? So um, is movement culture very like prevalent? Um, I think the movement culture in New York City is very, is weird, right? Because um, especially where I am, I'm in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And, you know, there's a lot of like, gentrification going on. So a lot of the fitness stuff is very trendy, like the new thing, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. um, there's like a lot of these boutique, like boot camp studios, and mm -hmm. things of that nature. And, you know, I think I think that's cool for what it is. But um it's like they're putting out more products, but but the product is is crappy, you know. Mm -hmm. You know they're they're putting out something mediocre and nice packaging, basically. Right. So there's a, a huge culture based around that, um, but in terms of actual movement, it's like few and far between. So I felt like that was a a, a need, and that's part of what I'm trying to do with uh, moving project. Mm -hmm is to establish that culture. Right. So it's like, would you say most of the fitness, I mean, with, with gentrification and things like that, I mean, we experience it, you know, pretty much everywhere here in San Francisco. I mean, it's astronomical, right? Yeah. Like the tech industry has, has inflated everything in this, in this area. So, you know, you get, you know, I'm not knocking any of these places, but just to name a few, you got Barry's Boot Camp, Soul Cycle, Orange Theory, all these different, you know, kind of like, um, I, you can call them boutique, but they're, I mean, they're, I don't know, to me, it, it comes across as being like a high end cookie cutter kind of exactly. space, you yeah. know, and and to me, like, <clears throat> I kind of feel like it's it's for people who are like, they don't want to actually engage in thought or anything like complex or, you know, something that will actually help them 
grow both physically and mentally they're they're just like i just want to get in i want to sweat and i just want to be out you know um and so i i wonder like how long how long this is going to like prevail in in our in our society you know this type of i mean i think i think it's the the result of something deeper um I've been obsessed with uh, Katie Bowman lately, so a lot of my views are coming from that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not familiar with her. Oh, uh, you got to read this book, uh, Movement Matters. Uh, Movement so Matters. Amazing. Um, but I think it's a, there's a societal issue that's going on, and then that's just the result of the issue. So the issue is that um, we're more sedentary than we ever have been. And technology is uh, making us more comfortable and more sedentary. So it, it keeps going in that direction. So then right. we don't actually have to move to survive anymore. Like that's, mm-hmm. not, you literally don't have to leave your bed and you can have a, a business from your computer. You can order food, you can order furniture, you can order anything from your computer or from your phone. Sounds like Ready Player One. I just, yeah. I just read that book. <laughs> oh, I, I never read the, that book, but uh, you, you basically outsource your movement, right? Yeah. So yeah. then we go hard on the other end since we're not moving during the course of the day. Then we think, okay, well, I got to get my heart rate up. I got to do my cardio or I got to sweat now. You know? Right. And uh, so people people want to spend all their, you know, they want to say that they're attached to this thing. So it's like, I went to Barry's boot camp and I sweated and you see the sweat all over their face, Instagram selfie, you know, showing right. all their friends that they went to this studio, you know, but so the quality of the product, um, I've never taken a Barry's boot camp classes, but I've heard horror stories. Uh, but so people just want to say that they've been there and then, um, they it's kind of like the like place to be, to right? Yeah, the, the place to be. I mean, I think we've, we're kind of in that sort of society where it's like, I want to be in the place to be. And, you know, not to bash any of these, uh, any of these entities, but I think that's, you know, it's, you're right, it's, a, it's, a indi- it's indicative of kind of like the society we currently live in, where it's like, I need to be in the hot spot, the spot where everybody's at the best club, you know, it kind of like comes out of that sort of atmosphere, like, Oh, did you go to this club last night or you weren't at the popular club? You know, did you, you know, so it's like CrossFit was that thing for, for, for a minute. It's, I mean, it's still there, you know, and it's, it's evolved in its own ways, but it was kind of like that hot space that everybody wanted to be in. People didn't know much about it, didn't have a clue and, um, you know, subjected themselves to a lot of different things. But I think one of the things that you said that was really interesting that I wanted to kind of go back to was the sedentariness of our society. Because I was just talking to a, a client um, today about my thoughts on that very subject. And I was like, you know, for me as a, as a coach, you know, I feel like I don't move enough during the day. And I move a whole lot, you know, in comparison to my clients. And so, you know, I think one of the things that that I try to get across to people is that there's a difference between what we do and what we have our clients do or what we have, you know, the general population of people do. I feel like everybody wants to be a warrior these days or some sort of like... uh, you know, it's like mud runs are popular, Spartan races, like everybody has it in this, in their head after like 300 and these sorts of things, zombie apocalypse sort of like, yeah. I need to be ready for the apocalypse sort of thing. And I'm like, but you sit in your office all day and then you go and you do some deadlifts and some snatches on a body that's been sitting around all day and then tomorrow you go to the office and you sit down again so 
and and not to mention we have coaches out there who are not really paying much attention to like is this person does this person have the prerequisite you know strength mobility whatever it is to be doing what they're doing so i think we we kind of like go into this there's there's this cycle of like people like just really beating themselves up for that one hour out of their 24 hour day and then sitting like eight of them sleeping another eight of them if that um but yeah there's no like actual time spent on moving and and really exploring what you have and don't have you know I had a uh, I had a mentor, and w when I was first becoming a trainer, he was like the top trainer in the gym I was working at, and he said something that I use all the time. He was like, he would tell his clients, you know, if they're like, oh, why is my squat not getting better, or why can't I do this, or why can't I do that? He would be like, there's 168 hours in the week, and I see you for three of them. So, <laughs> like if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing the other 165 hours, you can't be mad at me when you don't get results. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. Like, so as a coach, it's no longer about, um, I mean, you're giving them what to do for those three hours, but also yeah. you're trying to make little changes to get them moving throughout the day. Right. So that when they come, to those three hours of the week or two hours or what have you, um, they're ready to go. Like you yeah. don't want to use those two hours to like, you know, okay, now we got to do something for your hips or we got to do this and we got to do that. Like this should be game time, you know? Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, yeah you're right. No, no, go ahead. You go ahead. No, I was saying, uh, yeah, you're right. It's game. It's, in a way it's game time, right? Like there's, I guess there's levels to, I kind of wrote something today about um, like our sport versus our activity. I mean, our sport versus our, our training for that sport. And I was kind of looking at the fact that, you know, I used to play basketball a lot recreationally and you know, I would go and I would, um, you know, I would dribble, I'd shoot around. That's like skills practice, right? You dribble yeah. around, you shoot, you do some things, moving around. Um, I would do weightlifting separately, right? So that sort of feeds into, you know, playing basketball, playing the sport. Um, but I wasn't really doing anything specific. But the minute I stopped playing basketball as a as a as a activity or as a sport, things have to change, right? Things evolve, right? So now, like I enjoy the mace, and I enjoy swinging the mace. So in my head, and I enjoy like animal flow, and I enjoy you know moving around doing that stuff. So in my head, I'm like, those are a couple of things I enjoy outside of like just the normal stuff with day to day with my family. But that's where I'm at. That's that's my sport, yeah. you know. So now I spend a lot of my time training for those things, right? So if you look at my Instagram and stuff like that, you'll see me doing, like, rotational prep work, stability stuff, you know. Why? Because I want to swing my mace nicely, you yeah. know, because I want to move through animal flow nicely, Um you know, because I want to be able to do these, the, the things that I enjoy nicely, I work on things that support that, you know, and I think like a lot of people um, don't frame their training in that way. No, 100%. Um, uh, it's always good to work towards a goal. Um, but I think people don't necessarily build the foundation first. Uh, they just kind of, you can, you can go into any gym and just see people doing things. Mm -hmm. And like, <laughs> uh, Quincy, uh, was, he posted a thing about, um, 
about how people use the Bosu ball mm -hmm. wrong. Like, uh, they're standing on it and, like, swinging <laughs> kettlebells and doing all this stuff. <laughs> And, uh, like, that's a perfect example of, like, what are you really training for with that? Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to – I'm often trying to figure that, that one out myself. Um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of things you can use the BOSU ball for, you know? There's no reason to knock the BOSU ball. But, yeah, some of the stuff you see people doing on it, it's like, really? That's – I mean, but I think I mean there's there's a place for you know innovation and exploration because you know I'm wearing a play like a human shirt so obviously uh, right but I, I think at the same time um, like not that you need to understand the concept of play but play is how you learn things right yeah but at the end of the day you know if you take that one modality, like, and I'm speaking, you know, specifically about this, this Bosu ball madness. Um, <laughs> if you, if you take a modality and you use that as your primary source of training, it's not like, like that. I don't know what that carries over into like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the thought process behind it. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we could go on and on about, I've seen, you know, not just the BOSU ball, but the, the stability balls, oh, yeah. um, you know, seeing people stand on top of those and do bicep curls. I'm like, yeah, all right, that's cool. Like, and then they tell you like some like high speed answer, like, yeah, you know, cause it gives me the core activation and this. <laughs> <laughs> No? I could get you, you could get more core activation actually just standing on the ground doing yeah. stuff. So it's, it doesn't, yeah, it's really, it's, it's really phenomenal how, how people take these, these tools and modalities and, and, um, you know, I mean, I think it's one of those things where people are just looking for more likes, um, and, and yeah. more clicks. Um, cause that's kind of where we're, where we're at today. Like the more likes, you have and the more followers you have that means the more popular you are which means clearly you know much more than all the rest of us and yeah. you are definitely a master at it all so <laughs> that's that's um that's where we're at um so anyway uh what do you got coming up next as far as like you know, moving project. I saw you guys are doing, I don't know if this is a part of the moving project or not. And I wanted to bring this up because you're okay. doing illegal stuff <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you're posting it, which I'm like, that's kind of weird. That's kind of like those rappers who like telling themselves. Yeah. And yeah I'm yeah. like, is this a generational thing? What, what are we doing here? <laughs> well, so, um, well, so the only reason I posted that was because, uh, you know, I have a thing for like urban exploration and I, you know, I like seeing, uh, the world in a, in a way that most people that, that most people don't. But right. the only thing that I was really trying to, uh, get across from that sort of thing was that it's just another physical outlet. And this was, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I did a, a really good job of showcasing some of the physical movements that we had to do within the videos, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, uh, I train move net. So a lot of people don't like that kind of stuff because they don't see a context for it. But mm -hmm. I found when I was doing some of this exploration, a lot of these movements that I, had, you know, drilled and trained in move net, um, came very in handy you know, having to climb things, uh, having to crawl. We had to low crawl through like a really small space. Um, mm -hmm. We had to do like a lot of uh, ground movement transitions um, and, you know, training movement gave me like a huge toolbox that suddenly made a lot of sense when I was in these different situations. Um, and, and one of the things is when you when you train in a gym to do something, everything is is the most perfect scenario that it can be, right? You know, the weight right. is evenly distributed. Um, 
when you hold on to something, you know that it's strong enough to support you. Um, the, the situations are, are ideal. But when you're doing something um, in the real world, in a natural environment, these all become variables. If you're holding on to, um, you know, I'm trying to, to climb up the side of a, a, a building or something like that. I don't right. know whether that foothold can actually support me. So now I have to use, you know, my sensibility and sensitivity to be able to uh, test uh, the, the ground that I'm walking on or test the handholds or be able to react to a changing environment. Um, you know, you know, when you do a pull up in a gym, the bar is completely even at a certain thing. Right. When you do a pull up in real life, you could be doing it on a wall or right. it could be one hand up here, one hand down here, or it could be a hand turned sideways and like this, and you still have to do the pull up. So right. it challenges your body in, in completely different ways. You know, it gives t context to all these different movements, but it allows mm -hmm. for adaptation and exploration. Right. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, where'd you guys Where'd you guys uh, go? I think you guys were in the. Uh, so, so that was uh, Philadelphia. Um, oh, okay. We did a, a Philly trip, and uh, my friend, who's more of a nerd with the, he's like the exploration nerd, the same way that uh -huh. like a movement nerd. Um, okay, so she like. You guys combine powers. Exactly. <laughs> so when it comes to something sketchy and we don't know how to get in, they always send me in first because then I figure out the movements. <laughs> so. Yeah, like do you watch? Uh, do you watch uh, Walking Dead? Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you're like Glenn. They're gonna send yeah, you exactly. in, and uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Glenn, go in there and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all pretty, pretty cool stuff. I mean, urban exploration, you always see that kind of stuff on, you know, movies. Um, but you don't really get a chance to, you know, experience it unless you actually do it or you're a graffiti artist or things like that, exactly. you know, because I, you're, graffiti artists tend to do a lot of, you know, exploration to these uncharted territories in our cities. Yeah. Um, um so how has, I mean, with, with um, your program, how has it been like received like in the community? I mean, you're, you're saying you're, you want to build a community, but um, in the videos and things that I see, you have a very diverse um, group of, of people that you're working with and, and that are, engaging with you um how is that being being received by you know people of color and and you know women as well um, um i think i i went about building this very strategically um so one of the things like we discussed uh before is you know, I want to, a lot of the certifications, a lot of things that I've done have been very, like, one-sided, you know? So you, I never really saw people that look like me doing um, different kind of movement things at very high levels or, you know, like, exploring when it comes to, like, unconventional type of movement stuff. Mm -hmm. So, specifically at this current stage being that, you know, moving project is, is really in its infancy. I'm specifically looking for people of color, uh, to, to add value to this tribe. Not to say that like, you know, it's not all inclusive, but I'm specifically looking for, you know, those, that specific demographic. Um, and I mean, I think it, it's been working very well. It's like um, people are drawn to this because there's there's not really anything out there like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I sell t-shirts and stuff like that, but that's just that's like a side thing. 
but mm -hmm. the movement part is completely free. So I'm, I'm not really trying to sell people movement. Um, right. You know, this is just like a, a another supplementary uh, means of income so I can sustain uh, the actual thing. But I want to make this community completely free where you can mm -hmm. tap into it and you can meet other people with other skills and, you know, make, make friends, you know? Yeah. So that, that makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, we need, um, some of that these days. I think, you know, movement is a, is a language, uh, a means of communicating that kind of transcends like the verbal, you know, cues. And like you said, with touch and things like that, that's one of the things I experienced with, with the Parkon was, you know, um, and I don't want to go too, too much in depth because I would love to have Andrew yeah, on here as I well. Was him last um, time. But um, yeah, he, uh, you know, just that, that opportunity to, like be uncomfortable. I mean, uh, I don't know if I still have the video of, of uh, me and Andrew doing Parkon uh, here in San Francisco, but I didn't know him, you know, and, yeah. you know, he reached out to me like, Hey, you know, I'm gonna be in San Francisco. And I'm like, and he's like, I want to show you some Parkon stuff. And I was like, ah, okay. And so, you know, we met up and I'm, I'm sure he could sense that I was very like, like standoffish. And of course, some construction workers, you know, came to the area that we were in. We were in this totally isolated area and these construction workers come up and they decide to have their food like right there on the bench next to us. <laughs> and so we're doing stuff there. And then now I'm feeling like not only am I feeling already feeling weird, but now I have these two guys here watching two guys engage and interact in a way with both each other and the space in such a way that's uncomfortable to them. Yeah. But then also uncomfortable to me because I'm like, I'm not used to this. I'm not yeah. used to exploring this in this way. Um, but I, I definitely think it's an awesome uh, thing, movement and being able to uh, communicate with each other through movement um, and through play and all these different things. So that's, that's really cool that you've, you've established this, this project. And, and I've become like completely consumed with this, uh, this whole idea of play and like improvisation and stuff. Uh, yesterday I was with Andrew and he took me to a contact improv jam and I had never mm -hmm. been to one before. So I didn't really know how things were like how it went, but, uh, yeah. It was it was interesting, man. Yeah. It was really really interesting. I'm sure because <laughs> uh, it's like, um, you know, like we like like uh, when when you were doing it, uh, the Parkon, you, you felt how you know the outside world doesn't really accept this or they don't really know what it is, so it's weird. To right. Me. Now imagine being in a room where this is like super normal. And right. you're the one that's kind of like, I don't know, this is like kind of weird, you know? <laughs> like, then, then you're the minority, like, technically, right. in, that, in that situation. Um, but uh, it, was, it was really interesting, and I learned a lot about uh, uh, human interaction. Because at the end of the day, all you're doing is having a physical conversation with someone. Right. Yeah. So uh, the same rules apply. You know, if like if I'm trying to like move with you and like you're tense or, you know, you're like afraid of touching, it doesn't make for a very interesting conversation. And right. someone will just walk away and dance with somebody else. Right. You know, um, the same way as if you're like way too into it, like you're just like, yeah, like, let me touch you. <laughs> That makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> right. So it's yeah. no different than when you're when you're talking to someone. Um, right. I think it's it's really interesting um, when it's male male versus male female. 
yeah. um, interaction as well. You know, I think one of the things because I <laughs> I danced uh, I danced also for quite a while. Um, so for me, like when I finally had a male female interaction with that sort of engagement, I was quite comfortable with that you know relationship because I've had you know salsa experience where it's like okay lead and follow only difference is is that now you're like trying to uh listen and I mean in salsa you're trying to listen as well yeah but it's more of a male centric sort of you lead you follow and that's the way the dynamics kind of kind of work in, yeah. in on the salsa scene which is once again indicative of culture right cultural norms like the guy is the leader and you know the woman is the follower so it kind of creates that that dynamic which you know is when you think about where salsa comes from and you think about like the cultural norms you know uh of male and female um it it completely makes sense but yeah, that conversation, that communication through touch and the amount of pressure you give and the amount of pressure you're able to receive and things like that was just really um, an interesting experience for me. And, and then applying that in the park on was really, was really cool as well. Um, I think, uh, so, oh, oh I was just no, I was going go ahead before one more, uh, one more point was yeah. um, when you, when you mentioned like the gender roles and, and salsa, like in in the whole contact thing it's not so much a, a gender role as it is a power dynamic mm -hmm. and you know you can learn so much more about a person just by touching them without saying anything mm -hmm. so uh like i experienced this last night and it was just like it was like mind-blowing um the first person i i danced with was andrew because i didn't you know he had to teach me the, the ropes so, of so uh the first person outside of him was another guy and uh i was the one that was like a little uh i felt like my confidence was kind of low because you know it's my first contact jam i've never done anything like that so the power dynamic wasn't so much like i was the passive one and he was the like uh the leader so i was the mm -hmm. who was the leader so then you know, we're going, we're moving around. I got the hang of it. I started to build up my confidence. So the next person I danced with was was a woman. And, you know, I kind of put my feelers out there just to see where the dynamic was. And I felt as though she wanted me to lead. That's what I was getting from her body language. Mm -hmm. So I start leading. But then this is what, this is the interesting part, was as I started leading, she wasn't receptive to the way that I was leading. <laughs> so, you know, the power dynamic kept shifting back and forth. So then right. when I would, when I would back off, you know, cause maybe I felt like she was being uncomfortable or something like that. Right. So when I started to back off, then she would, it was almost as like, like uh, she was baiting me to right. lead, but then giving me resistance when I was leading. <laughs> right. And now, if, if you equate that to you know human interaction that's like that's a lot like when you're flirting with a girl like right you know? yeah i mean it's it's and like i said with with salsa you experience the same thing it was one of those things where um i often oftentimes i had um women tell me afterwards like they expected me to be because of my physical build and my yeah. look and when i they expected me to be a more physical leader, like a yeah. more like aggressive, like leader, but they were always like, wow, you were so like, you know, easy and gentle. And, you know, like I could feel that, that interaction. Yeah. And, you know, I would walk away from, from dances. That, like there's clearly like when you have a community of dancers, there's clearly people you really, really enjoy dancing with. You have yeah. a good like interaction and dance relationship with this, with these particular people because the communication is good. But there's times I walked away from dances and I'm just like, 
I never want to dance with this woman ever again. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like the amount of resistance and then like, you know, wanting to do something else. And then you're like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll we'll do that. And then she's like, no. And then you could just feel this kind of animosity going yeah. on. You're like, we're just not right for each other. That's just, <laughs> that's it's just what it out. is. It's just not going to work. Yeah. So um, you're right. I mean, I think like this human interaction movement and all these things kind of help us all kind of, um, it's, it's a different form of, of communication. And I think yeah. it's a positive thing. And uh, I think it can be used in the long run. I, I think it could be used in a lot of different ways. And that's a topic for another day. Oh, but yeah. You can go on and on about that one. We've we've come up on the one hour mark and uh, uh, it's been awesome getting to chat with you and and uh, you know talk about these topics and especially get uh, talking about the movement project. Um, so if people are interested in that in New York, they can find you um, at Moving Project. Um, I think it's well, it's spelled. You have to spell it for everybody so that they uh, can. M V N G. So, MVNG yeah. dot project, right? On uh, Instagram? Yeah, so Instagram is uh, MVNG dot project. Um, I have a public Facebook group where, you know, it's more of the promotion of, you know, the, the clothing and um, some different events. But then I also have a private meetup group. Um, so where it's, it's not really me just okay, we're meeting up this time. It's, it's kind of like a collaborative effort. So mm -hmm. I try to make it so that I'm not, I don't want to be the face of this. I just want to start it and then I want to get it going type of mm -hmm. thing, you know? Um, so uh, people post events that they're going to, even if it's not my event. Um, it, it's like a network. So, right. you know, anyone you... in New York City that wants to be part of the network, uh, just hit me up on Facebook and talk about it cool and uh you also have the youtube channel right yes. with all um the videos from the different uh events or activities that you've you've recorded right yeah so i'm trying to get better with that um because it's hard being the photographer and the, facil the facilitator <laughs> at the same time yeah but uh i'm getting the hang of it i'm getting <laughs> um, all right man well it was good chatting with you um Always look forward play. to look forward to hanging uh coming up here soon in february for the yeah, steel be. mace workshop i'll be out there so um it's gonna be awesome to to reconnect and uh you know hang out have some coffee be coffee snobs in new york and oh i meant to tell you those shoes that you recommended me to get in chinatown those fei use in chinatown are like probably my most like cherished yep. thing right now twenty dollars <laughs> has never been so like wonderful like yeah. i've been using them um i've been using them to do like all my movement stuff on the ground and like animal flow and i mean of course it's not like being barefoot but i don't always like to be barefoot yeah. and i just feel like those shoes give you so much like like contact with the ground and with yeah. you know moving around i just like they they were a great recommendation i really um i really appreciate that so i'm definitely going to be in the market for a new pair as soon as these are completely run down into was, the ground I'm, I'm trying to get them up on my website uh i found i found a vendor that uh that sells them but mm -hmm. um you know there's some people are trying to trying to make the price way too high and I I don't want to you know overprice somebody um yeah so that that may or may not be up on my website but uh <laughs> but honestly I think they were they were some of the best shoes like um I ended up splurging a little bit more and I I bought a pair of the Evo barefoots and mm -hmm. those are amazing uh, they just feel like a little bit more substantial. Like I'm getting a yeah. lot of wear out of them, but um, mm -hmm. the Feus for the price, like 
Yeah, yeah, for the price, you can't beat them. You can't beat it. You can't yeah. beat it. Yeah. I mean, they're... I I love the fact that my ankle is able to, like, roll around and do all types of, you know, crazy stuff. My toes and feet are able to, like, fully feel the ground. I even feel like they're better than any of the Vibrams I ever owned. I mean, I used to own Vibrams, and, yeah. I mean, I think I still have a pair, but... Like, yeah, they, you know, you're closer to the ground and yeah, your, your toes are somewhat free, but like, I don't, I don't feel like, I felt like the, the, the Feiyus are just so much more in tune yeah. with what I'm trying to, with what I'm trying to do. And you also don't look like as much of a weirdo when you wear uh Feiyus as you do when you wear Vibrams. <laughs> right. Because like, you gotta be really they're stylish. Vibrams, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, they're stylish. Yeah. All right, man. I'm going to wrap this up. We're going to let this go. And um, thanks to all our viewers for watching this. It's awesome. Episode three is a wrap. All right. Peace out. Peace.